Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's resident talk. Sitka is located at Cascade Head on the north central Oregon coast and resides on the unceded traditional lands of the indigenous people now represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. There's much to learn and just one step uh, we encourage you to take, especially when you are planning a visit to the Sitka Center or the Oregon Coast, uh, is to visit the Grand Ron Chuchalu Museum and Cultural Center, which is such a vibrant place. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the first of tonight's residents. So Francisca Burnett is, uh, was born and raised in Santiago, Chile. Francisca is, uh, Oh, excuse me. Uh, so she's uh, in Santiago, Chile, and then lived for a short and long periods of time in Chile, Argentina, Spain, and New Zealand. And her work has been exhibited in Chile, Argentina, Mexico, the UK, the US, Spain, Greece, and Belgium. Through her creative practice, she explores biomorphics and duality, presenting opposites such as organics, and geometric forms, translucent versus opaque forms, lightness and darkness, interacting as metaphors of the tangible and the intangible. We are thrilled that she is tangibly with us at Sitka. So please welcome Francisca Brunet to the Sitka Center. Hello everyone. And thank you so much to the whole staff here at Sitka for their kindness and for making all of this possible back from where I come from. Um, these kind of opportunities for artists are very rare. So this is my first residency ever. And as it is, I was really excited about coming to Sitka and experiencing this residency thing for the first time. And I think I wasn't really building any expectations or any preconceived ideas about what could happen here. And neither was I planning on what I was going to work at. But of course, in this uh, excitement, one loses real notion of time and what can actually be done and achieved in five weeks. So I thought I could do everything in these five weeks, like painting and drawing and film shooting and ceramics and so on, but you hit against the wall of reality. So I'll start sharing now. When I first got here, uh, as I was saying, I was invaded by this feeling of making the most out of my time here at Sitka. And I started working right ahead in the studio in many different things at the same time with no focus at all. And at some point I got really overwhelmed, which is really something I'm always dealing with. So I just try to take it light and easy and just see it as a part of who I am and try to bring it up somehow into my practice. Uh, so now I would like to show you just quickly some of my paintings so you can get an idea of the kind of work I do. Um, I mostly walk through the path of painting nowadays, but I also love photography and both are things I do in parallel, but I always find it difficult to connect both practices. So photography has turned into something I pretty much do for pleasure and just keep it for myself. But going back to these paintings, they are all on paper. I feel incredibly comfortable working with water-based paints, such as gouache, inks, and watercolors, and always using paper as my main surface. And um, so I'm very, uh, in a very intimate and intuitive way, I work around ideas that speak about ambiguity, about mystery, duality, um, conflicted identities. Um, and I always try to explore this confrontation between the wild and the civilized. And I believe all of these ideas appear through forms and objects that come in a very spontaneous way. And often the primary idea of a painting is very raw and it is the material itself that starts to build a more finished idea during the process. So as you can see in these paintings, the figures 
seem to be very human-like, but do not define themselves in an absolute way. And they are often put uh, or confronted with this um, distorted man-built environments that sort of keep them in a restricted area, leaving us with this idea of exuberant beings, I don't know if that word exists, um, imprisoned or contained in this solitary domestic life spaces. So these are a few. And now I would like to show you just a few sets of photographs that kind of illustrate uh, what for me would be a linking thread uh, with my painting practice. And maybe it's not obvious at all, but with photography, I've noticed that I'm always trying to capture uh, this same relation between a subtle human presence with um, an environment filled with a kind of mystery that can sometimes be given by light and others maybe just by the composition of the image itself. But again, it is this wilderness confronted with science and traces of civilization. So now that you have an idea of the kind of work I do, I would like to continue with what has been going on here at Sitka. And as I was telling you before, when I got to this overwhelming point that maybe happened uh, after the first week here at Sitka, I started to slow down a little bit at the studio and take walks instead, do some kayaking, uh, get to know a little bit better the place and get familiarized with the animals around and just kind of experience this place and it's crazy, ever-changing weather, the tides and the light, etc. And I kind of realized in a more vivid way that my process is usually very led by the connection of the feeling of the material or, or the feeling of the material itself. And for example, with painting, it is all very related to fluidity and practicing a particular amount of control during the process while I also let the material speak to me and lead me maybe to places I didn't even know about. And as for photography, it all comes to playing with light and composition and letting both factors work around this idea of absence and presence in the image. So what I wanted at this point was to bring together these essential things about painting and photography so I started to experiment with cyanotype, incorporating both factors, light and fluidity. And I went a few times to the beach and to the estuary. So here's the kayak, Sitka's kayak. And with my sensitized paper, and I basically let both factors do its work by exposing them to the waves and also to to the wind and to the furrows left by the tide around the estuary to the shades sorry uh, so this one's are from the beach this is the estuary and what i what i meant by furrows it's this i don't know if you can see it okay so these are some results from what I did at the estuary. I don't have good pictures of, uh, of the work I did uh, with the waves, but hopefully I can show them later sometime. Uh, but after this, I felt the need to bring up to the equation other signs of this water, of this moisture that invades everything here at the west, northwest coast. So I started to just grow moss that had fallen from the trees on the top of these cyanotypes. And as many of them, sorry, these are all the results from this previous exercise. And as many of this moss was still wet, their reaction of water and light was simultaneous resulting in this very interesting patterns. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows the process here, but it basically, basically goes like this. So the sensitized 
surface start, starts to develop as soon as it gets in contact with water and not allowing those wet parts to keep reacting to light long enough to turn blue. And as the sensitized material reacts to light, depending on how long the exposure to sunlight goes for, this indigo blue becomes more and more intense once you develop the cyanotype. So the entire process really depends on light and water and their interaction mainly. And then the snowstorm came to Sitka. And, and at this point, um, it had all been about action and reaction, but there wasn't much of an intention together with the process. And it kind of felt uh, as if there was something more personal missing. So instead of just sensitizing the whole paper as if the process would be just about photography, I began to directly paint with the chemicals using the fluidity of the solution to create this human-like forms that are always present in my paintings. And as you can see in the same way as it happens with watercolors, for example, the excess of water or the higher concentration of the solution, uh, they do its own part in terms of depth and saturation. But I also kept applying these reserves of light using moss uh, to create the similar patterns as the ones that appear in many of my photographs. So these are some details. And this is how they look like when they are developed. Um, so this experiments of cyanotypes have felt as a way of connecting in a more direct way all this inner approach I usually have in my practice with the sort of reflections that come from the external. And it has been very important to me to realize that whatever it is that I'm working on, let it be uh, more reflexive or more visceral, it is always somehow connected with the place and the circumstances I'm facing in a particular fraction of time. And it might not show in the most obvious ways, but it surely floods the work with the emotions and thoughts and the ideas triggered by the place. And I believe in my case, uh, in the end, it is mainly this what conducts my creative process. So these are not finished yet, and I'm not quite sure what will happen to them or how they're going to end up, but we'll see. Uh, but in the meantime, so these are some details. In the meantime, of course, I kept painting and drawing at the studio and shooting some film around Sitka because there's no way I can just stay focused on one thing at a time. Uh, so what I'm showing you now are some small paintings I've been working on. And these are some bigger ones. And as, as you see, they're pretty much the same as the ones I was showing you at the beginning of the presentation. And I've been also working in two oil paintings in, in unstretched, unprimed canvas, which is something I'm very excited about because I haven't been painting with oil since I was in art school. So, and that was a long time ago. So it has been really fun. So here are some details and Here are some tiny landscapes. I do not usually paint landscapes, and when I do, they are just fiction. Uh, but again, I believe that they absolutely reveal the place where I'm at. And in this ones in particular, they were sort of a result of a frustrated mistake of another thing I was trying to do. And in this silent rage, I just use all the remaining puddles of water with inks and pigments from this previous disaster to make this 
monoprint landscapes that look very apocalyptic, just like Sitka's weather. So they just fell right. And as if they would have been unveiled by these other tiny unsuccessful attempts. And just, so here are some details. And just to close my presentation, I wanted to show you this big drawing that has been working on me and not the other way around since I got here, because it kind of reveals for me what my experience here at Sitka has been all about, even though I'm not even sure what it reveals yet. But what I do know is that all that I've experienced here is somehow loaded into this drawing. It has been like a sort of escape every time I have felt confused here. So it's kind of a summary of my time here at Sitka. And as a final reflection about my time here, um, it has taught me a lot about my impatience and about the importance of self-reflection in my practice but also about enjoying those moments of terrible questioning because they're necessary and they're not such a big deal. But this time has also been about embracing my own chaotic thinking and let it do its part, but also learning to calm down and know that not producing can be as huge as producing. So this is what I've done so far. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks again, Sitka, for having me. And I'll make the most out of my last week here at Sitka. <laughs> thank you so much, Francisca, for showing uh, us your work and taking us inside your residency. Thank you. Maddie Bacon is a non-binary artist, storyteller, and conservationist. They hold a BFA of Fine Art from the University of Delaware. Their art takes form in many mediums, including film, animation, comics, and paintings. Maddie is the author and illustrator of two different books, Desert Spell and Commotion in the Ocean, and several zines and mini comics, including Ancient Warrior and Notes from the Field. They have spent the past several years working seasonally for conservation corps, national parks, and national forests, which has been the source of much inspiration for their work. Please welcome Maddie Bacon to the Sitka Center. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, like you said, my name is Maddie. Um, I'd really like to thank the Sitka Center for this time and space to work. I haven't really had access to a really big studio like this in a while. So it's been a really big treat. Yeah, so some background on me is that I have spent a couple years working seasonally for conservation corps, the forest service and the park service. Um, and it really brings a lot of meaning and purpose to my life to be doing work on public lands and trying to give back to spaces that have done so much for me personally. And then it also, leads over and sort of gives me a much stronger and meaningful art practice. Um, and so in my work, I really consider myself a storyteller. I've worked in a lot of different mediums um, from printmaking, video, animation, painting. Um, and the thing that always sort of come up, like strings them all together for me is narrative and like a narration that kind of goes around in them. Um, and so uh, lately I've been really writing and illustrating comics. Um, so these are a couple of pages picked out from like some recent comic projects that I've done. Um, some of them are fictional stories while others are more like nonfiction or almost memoir essays. Um, when I was younger, I really loved reading, but I struggled to find queer characters that I could relate to. So really what inspires me to write something is when it's a story that I would really want to read. And so whether that's a reflection on how my work has shaped my gender experience or about how obsessed I am with horseshoe crabs, I really just let my niche interests guide the stories that I'm writing. Um, and so for my time here at Sitka, the project that I have mostly been working on is for the Olympic National Park. 
I am part of their terminus project, which is meant to memorialize the glaciers in their park, which will all um, be gone by 2070 due to climate change. Um, once the project is complete, there's going to be an interactive map where you can go in and click on individual glaciers and go and look at art pieces that are specific to each glacier. Um, I really recommend people going to the Olympic National Parks website and like checking it out. Um, they've kind of got a mock-up of like what it's going to look like and I think it's going to be really special once like all of the art has been kind of collected for it. Um, and this is my glacier right here, Mount Steele. It is a permanent snow field right there kind of tucked into the top of the glacier. Um, so it's been a really um, challenging and interesting piece to work on. The first thing that I did was spend several weeks reading through scientific articles and talking to Bill Baucus, who is the, the glacier scientist up at Olympic, to just learn as much as I could about these glaciers. And then I had all of this information that I had to somehow <clears throat> turn into a narrative. Um, because what I really didn't want to do is just make illustrations to go along with the scientific papers. If people want to read the scientific papers, they'll just read the scientific papers. What I wanted was a story about these glaciers that takes all of this science and data and helps us think about it in a more philosophical way um, to be able to ask emotional questions that you aren't really allowed to have in scientific papers to think about this human, this um, as a person that also works for national parks doing a lot. Of, found it really fascinating to kind of like understand like physically what these people have to do to go out and like do this research on the glaciers um, and the other protocols in their park. And so I've really settled on this script that deals with these questions of why do we pick certain things to study and what is really worth our time and effort to put research into. Um, some of these uh, images were sent to me by the scientists, but you can see some of the other ones are some screen grabs from this video that North Cascades National Park made called Keepers of the Beat, which is actually a really beautifully done video. I highly recommend going and watching it. So for a bit of my process is I try to have the script pretty much mostly written out and done before I do any drawing. And then I'll do these thumbnails, which are these small quick sketches where I'm trying to figure out where um, what each page is going to look like. And honestly, these scribbles probably don't make any sense to anyone but me. And sometimes they don't even make sense to me when I go back and look at them. So sometimes that's not very helpful. <laughs> and then I start, um, <coughs> then I start drawing. Um, primarily I work with ink and watercolor though lately I've been incorporating markers. Um, this has really been the part that I love the most about the process. I just love playing around with images and color and kind of seeing like what's going to go together and be really fun and interesting looking. So here is some of the pages that I have been working on. I'm just going to kind of flip through them. So these ones are a little bit more done, more fleshed out. They're almost done. You can kind of see how these other ones are works in progress. And you can see how some of these images are really influenced by <coughs> the images I was sent from the park. And this is, you can kind of see where, um, they, the process of what it looks like as I'm working on them, like they've got kind of these, the outlines before I add the color. So um, I'm going to be continuing to work on this comic 
Um, and then it's gonna be, um, you can see it on their website in the Terminus Project once it's done. Um, but if you're interested in reading any of my other comics, um, you can read them, pretty much all of them on my website or on my Instagram. Um, and thanks so much everyone for listening to my talk. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, just some comments in the chat uh, for uh, Francisca. These paintings, drawings, and sanotypes are so visceral and alive, stunning work. And Francisca, your process is fascinating. That last piece is stunning. So thanks folks for uh, chiming in and, and sharing your, your insights and your questions in the chat and the, the Q&A. All right. Diana Shin holds an MFA in fiction from the University of, Mont of Montana. Her work appears most recently in Diagram, Electric Literature, Missouri Review, Baltimore Review, and Third Coast Magazine. She is a recipient of fellowships from Hedgebrook, Artist Trust, and the M Literary Residency. She lives in Seattle and serves as a contributing editor to Moss, a journal of the Pacific Northwest. Please welcome Diana Shin to Sitka. Thank you, Allison, and to the fellow residents here. Um, I'm so blown away by your work and I'm so excited to see more. Uh, so I have to admit, I was very anxious as I prepared to spend time at SICA. Um, I applied for the residency uh, and made note of how I had been setting aside, um, you know, moving away from creative work or community work after the pandemic began. And I'd been slowly finding my way back into creative work and finding new ways to connect with the joy in writing that felt familiar and dependable, but was so often elusive. Um, getting to that joy is like making myself trudge up a dirt trail over several switchbacks before I finally arrive at the sunny meadow where everything is bright and easy, kind of like this meadow. So anyway, I submitted writing samples from new work that felt playful and refreshing and applied with the intention to complete the draft of a novel I had been working on for several years. Um, I was a bit nervous about that commitment and also about tying up other loose ends to free up the time for writing. So I did not finish a draft of a novel in two weeks, but I got through the middle of it and I found voices that I previously couldn't access and discovered new threads and themes um, and managed to move the plot along where I didn't think there had been much plot at all. And I also spent a lot of time thinking about writing and creativity. Uh, during the drive down to Sitka from Seattle, I listened to a two-hour podcast about the neuroscience of creativity, moving from divergent thinking to convergent thinking, and I brought with me a prescription for um, ADHD, a somewhat new diagnosis for me, and I also started exploring guided yoga nidra, also known as non-sleep um, non deep rest meditation, and so it's helpful, I think, to have a lot of these other tools with me. Uh, to ease into the writing, I also spent a lot of time earlier in the day just working on some free writing and getting into that um, creative zone before moving into the novel. And that during that time, other projects and ideas would also emerge. So it is hard to stay focused on one thing, as Francisca mentioned. Um, I kept these index cards taped to my desk. Uh, let's see. Um, I took this photo more recently at home, but we've got Iris Murdoch on the left. Every novel is a wreck of a good idea. And then Shun Ke Yi, a novel must have the power to offend. That's her off with her note for Death View, which is translated from Chinese. And then, um, so these, these gave me permission to write without editing or centering, to write poorly and to keep writing even when the writing got weird. And that third index card is just a note to self, a reminder that sometimes you have to make a few decisions when you're writing a novel um, and to figure out how the characters in the plot are going to serve the story that you're trying to tell. Now there's a few rips in that index card because I spilled some tea. Um, so everything I wrote in at Sitka, however, is still kind of new and in a state of terrific mess, so I'm still reveling in that mess. I thought I would just share some more general thoughts about creativity because I think I'm recovering in some ways about how I approach the creative work. I once had a professor in graduate school who opened class by sitting down and asking, um, so you're all writing about 25 hours a week, right? And I think we all just like were stunned by the question and spent some time staring at each other. Nobody said anything. Uh, we were you know, teaching and also taking our other classes. 
And the professor went on to share more about his own writing schedule uh, when he was in graduate school and how important it was to keep showing up for the work. Even you know if you're consistent and faithful, then the work will be faithful to you. And I do appreciate this encouragement. I think it's important writing advice. Uh, but it so often comes with a rigid set of rules, like making sure you write at least one hour a day or show up at the same time, the same place for a set number of hours so your brain gets trained and remembers what it's supposed to do. And more often than not, there's a bit of bravado and competition involved. I've heard from other writers about how the world falls away and they forget to eat meals. And I'm, you know, I often can't get myself to sit at the desk until unless I place a snack directly in front of the keyboard. I also know writers who don't do any screen time, and I think I know we're all trying to figure it out, but it's hard for me to trust anyone who does not watch TV. Uh, and then the most intimidating group, I think, is the one that wakes early before the sun rises, before their children get up, before they have to go do their other job. And I've tried this before as well, but it actually turns out that waking up earlier doesn't actually add more hours to the end of your day, so time always catches up with me anyway. And I think the idea that scarred me most is the idea that a story can leave you if you are not giving enough time to it, that your project can just decide you're not worthy and abandon you. Elizabeth Gilbert, for instance, talks about a story passing from her to Anne Patchett through a kiss, and suddenly her stalled novel became the plot of Patchett's next book, and she moved on to another project. And I love, and it's a lovely thought, and I also like to think about stories as their own entities that exist around us that might show up next to us if we're showing up at the same time, same place, for the same number of hours a day. Um, but suppose you miss a day because you had like an emergency or a friend in need, or for whatever reason, you just had a bad day. It's so terrible to think a story could just leave you. And I know I've also experienced this at the same time because, you know, um, a novel is a sustained breath. That's something I read before coming to Sitka, and I don't remember the author anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but when you're in motion for a project, it's easier to stay in motion. And when you stop, it's just harder to hear, to catch the sound again, to hear like the tone and the voice that you were following. And it feels like you're never going to reach that meadow or that you're not headed anywhere, really. Um, so if you don't have time to sustain a novel, will the novel become someone else's? For years, I thought this was true. And I was really grateful to hear Samantha Thornhill speak once um, and to be reassured that your work remains your work. Uh, and when you have time and attention to give to it, then everything you need to express will still be yours to express. It will still be waiting for you. And it's not anything that you can pass on to anyone else, even if you tried. Uh, perhaps I think when you return to the work, it's different from what you remember because it's grown with you and changed with you. It's shaped by what you've encountered and read and learned since the last time you sat down to write. Um, so here are some of the things I've been learning. Writing is seasonal. There are generative seasons when new ideas pour out and seasons for editing and revision to shape those ideas. There are times for gathering or inspirations and times for rest and shoring up energy. And there are no empty seasons. There were a few years when I was not writing much, but I was still writing and I was gathering information so that when the days opened up, I knew where to go. The ideas had percolated. My brain, my brain for that. Um, and learning to wait for the high tide when creativity is churning, but also to appreciate and embrace the low tide where there's time to see how things have settled, to discover what is washed up on the shore and to see things from different angles. In addition to the cycle of seasons, I'm interested in other patterns of nature and how they instruct the work, the way we work and the way we shape our narratives. Uh, Matthew Salisis pushes us to consider associative logic and patterns of texture rather than logic or structure. Um, Jane Allison explores narrative forms within waves, spirals, fractals, and radials. And Adrienne Marie Brown considers patterns as well and believes that complex patterns and change can be created through authentic connections and relatively small interactions. And maybe those interactions can include the private moments when we are hearing a story reading a book, or consuming another form of art. Um, Brown's concept of emergent strategy also centers joy and wonder. 
Um, and I hope that I will always be able to find these things in the process of creative work. And it's so nice to hear um, others mention joy and wonder as well. So I'm not sure who else may have needed to hear these things, but these are some of the gifts I have received from my time at SICA. And I hope it's a place that continues to bring wonder to those who spend time here. I'm really grateful for my time here. So although I didn't share much from my um, reading excerpts or anything, you can find uh, some stories linked from my website as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for sharing your insights and your reflections. Zane Jukadar is the author of the novels, The 30 Names of Night, which won the Lambda Literary Award and the Stonewall Book Award in 2021, and The Map of Salt and Stars, which won the 2018 Middle East Book Award and was a Goodreads Choice Awards and Wilbur Smith Adventure Writing Prize finalist. His work has appeared in Salon, The Paris Review, Them, and elsewhere, and has been included in anthologies, including Kink, This Arab is Queer, Fit for the Gods, and Writers to a Letter of Color, and has been twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Please welcome Zane Jukadar to the Sitka Center. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so yeah, I'm really psyched to be at Sitka. Um, I actually, it was funny. Uh, when um, when Chachalu Museum was mentioned, Maddie and I were just there this morning. It was really amazing. Um, I just got here, um, was here for the snowstorm, but um, have been really enjoying being able to kind of like work and then also take some breaks to go hiking. We went kayaking. It's having a very good effect on my work. So I'm really grateful to Sitka for this time and space. Um, I'm a Syrian American writer. I'm originally from New York City. I was born in New York City, um, so Lenape Hoking. And I'm currently living in Italy, in Bergamo, in Northern Italy with my partner who's, uh, who's from there. Um, and so it was a very long flight for me to get here. I'm still a little bit jet lagged, but it's okay. Uh, I'm gonna be here until the beginning of April. So I, um, I'm here hoping to finish the draft of a novel that I've been working on since pretty much the first lockdown of the pandemic. Um, so a few years now. Uh, and I think like a lot of other writers, the pandemic has not been this, the easiest time for um, getting writing done. So, um, I, but I really feel, um, as I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, I really feel like this is the, this is the right place to get to the end of this draft. Um, so I'm primarily a novelist. Uh, I also write short stories and, and essays and a little bit of poetry, but these are my two novels um, that are mentioned in my bio. Um, I have my social media and my website up as well if you want to find more work. Um, and these were mentioned as well, but um, these are some of the anthologies that my work has been in. Um, two of them are, are still upcoming. So Letters to a Writer of Color, I have a um, a, a craft essay um, in this anthology uh, about um, language and translation and uh, queerness and transness and being a, a queer writer of color uh, and how that shows up in our work and how we translate ourselves or don't translate ourselves. Um, and that's out in March. And then um, the anthology Fit for the Gods sits out in August. Uh, I'm really psyched about that, actually, because I got to write a short story that was a retelling of um, Tiresias, so the the sort of the Greek seer um, who was changed into a woman for seven years and then changed back into a man, um, except that in this version, Tiresias is a uh, a trans guy at a party with his boyfriend that um, is just a disaster. Um, it's just like the worst party ever, um, and and it was a lot of fun to write. So anyway, um, that's some stuff that I have going on right now. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about what I'm working on here, but since it's still sort of in its tender stages, uh, I thought I would talk also a little bit about some of my previous stuff. So this map um, is pretty central to my first map of salt and star, explain what it is. So um, that first novel was about a Syrian American family who returns to homes in Syria after the father dies. Um, it's about, so it's about um, these three sisters and their mom who return there in 2011. And they are displaced by the encroaching civil war essentially um, and end up leaving Syria to reach a relative who's living in North Africa. 
Um, and as they are doing that, so they're traveling south and then um, west across North Africa, the story uh, is being narrated by this 12-year-old girl who is also telling herself a story. So she's telling herself this fable um, that her father told her before he died that's about a real map maker, actually, um, 12th century map maker, Ali Drisi, who made the most accurate map of the the world that was made in the Mediterranean to that date. And this is his actual map. Um, and as you can notice, um, South is at the top of this map instead of North. And that was a map making convention at the time. Um, and so these this group of map makers is sort of in her fable following the same path that she and her family are taking, but they're separated by 800 years. Um, and so the stories kind of alternate, um, but the book is, um, is a lot about, you know, like borders and the crossing of borders and um, what a map is and what a map represents and what a place can represent to us. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's, uh, it, I really enjoyed getting to sort of play with some of those reader expectations of like, yeah, let me tell you how, you know, what you think about the world um, isn't necessarily, can't necessarily be taken for granted, let's say, and what you think you know about maps um, can also be questioned. So, uh, and these are, it was translated into 20 languages. These are, um, to my su great surprise, um, so these are some of the international covers that I just think are really beautiful. Um, my second novel, The 30 Names of Night, um, which I, which was published after I came out as trans. Um, so in this novel, um, a Syrian American trans guy living in New York City discards one name and searches for another. And so we meet him when he is sort of not nameless exactly, but between names, I suppose you could say, searching for a name. Um, and so he looks to his queer and trans ancestors, including um, his ornithologist mother who died in a hate crime five years before the story begins. Um, trying to understand that the, there is precedence for his life and what that precedence looks like. Um, and as he's doing so, a plague of birds flocks to the city um, in a way sort of, uh, I envisioned like antibodies to a wound. Um, and so there's also some, some things, not only about climate change, but also these birds are drawing attention to um, violence that is remembered by the land itself. So um, starting with the genocide of indigenous peoples in Lenape Hoking and elsewhere, and then extending into um, the violence against enslaved people in New York City um, and present day violence against black, brown, queer, trans, disabled people and so on. Um, and so it's a, a book that's about a lot of different things. It's about Syrian immigration to the United States in the 30s and 40s. It's about being Arab American now and the ways that that can look different for more recently immigrated families than families that immigrated in the 30s and 40s. Um, it's about the mystery of this fictional Syrian American bird artist uh, who disappeared, um, and she's being sought for, sought after by um, by the protagonist, the present day protagonist, who's trying to unravel this mystery. Um, and it's about what it's like to be trans Arab Muslim uh, in New York City now, as well. Um, so. Uh, I could say more, but um, but yeah, that's essentially in a nutshell what that's about. This map is actually a map of what was the neighborhood of Little Syria in Lower Manhattan that is now um, there. I mean, they're trying actually that the Washington Street Historical Society is trying to get uh, some of this designated a historical area, but it's really there's only three buildings left because most of the neighborhood was demolished to build the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in the 40s. And so a lot of this novel is also about trying to like so, like search for history and make history visible um, in the places where things happen. I'm very interested in that. Um, and on that note, um, so because I'm working, I, I didn't move visuals because this is a novel progress. It doesn't have a cover. Um, I just thought I'd put up some, a little move um, that I've been, uh, kind of working on when I'm feeling stuck. So essentially, again, I've been working on this novel for a few years now. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, you know, a lot of my work centers on the connection between the collective futures and well-being of queer and trans people of color, and then the health and memory of the lands on which we actually live. 
And I'm really interested in how history is entangled with the present and, and is present in the present. Um, you know, over the last few years, uh, in particular, as social, political, and natural forces have created increasingly dangerous and difficult living conditions for queer and trans people of color, um, I, I have really been thinking a lot about um, how, you know, my life and work as an Arab Muslim trans now immigrant writer um, in Italy is intertwined with the health of my communities as a whole um, and the well-being of the earth itself. And so this project is um, not sure if it's young adult or adult It's sort of skewing increasingly adult um, with some very complicated themes. Um, but the novel is speculative. It's science fiction, essentially. Um, it's tentatively entitled Archipelago. And it follows what you think at first is a utopian community of trans people of color in a future world that is sort of racked by climate disaster and fascism. Um, and this group of people's chosen family has been uprooted from their ancestral lands and they're trying to survive both environmental and political threats as well as sort of intra-communal rifts, their shared trauma, um, and basically a lot of things that can't be erased by the utopian nature of, of their project of their living situation. So essentially this novel is asking to quote um, the Palestinian writer Sophia Azab in The Phenambulist, who will we be when we're free? Because um, we can talk about utopia and liberation, but I'm really interested in how we get there from here, um, drawing on the previous work of a lot of queer and trans of color and disabled elders. You know, you can sort of take us out of the trauma, but you can't take the traumatic past out of us. And so um, what are we, how are we going to treat each other? Um, and especially without resorting to separatism, for example. Um, and also, uh, you know, part of the reason I wanted to come to Sitka is because I'm also interested in how we're connected by the earth, how we're connected by the networks of not only human relationships, but animal, plant, and, and uh, fungal networks. And that plays a role in the novel as well um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a role of resisting capitalism and how those relationships help us to resist capitalism. What, um, for example, indigenous um, land stewardship can mean for our future, what land back can mean for the future of our planet. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of envision a, a future for all of us that hopefully looks, you know, a little bit different than what it looks like now, even, you know, while still recognizing with the forces that are at play now and and not um, imagining that they're going to sort of be magically wished away, um, but trying to say concretely, okay, if this is if this is the world we live in now, um, if we want a better world, if we want a better future, how do we actually get there from here concretely? So I'm really thankful to Sitka for the time and the space to work on this. Um, can visit my website and social media to see some of the other stuff I'm up to. Uh, but thanks very much. It's really great to be here. Thank you so much, Same. Wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Peggy Randon is an African-American, Afro-Caribbean visual artist and scientist from Detroit, Michigan. And unfortunately, Peggy had car trouble uh, en route to Sitka. Uh, so she changed plans. As an, actually, she's on a train uh, uh, moving toward us uh, right now. So uh, uh, wishing Peggy safe travels and uh, hopefully we'll find another way to connect you with Peggy's work. I think we're going to put a link to uh, Peggy's website in the chat too, if people want to learn more about them. So we have one more uh, resident presenting this evening. Orchidia Violetta is a Salvadoran American textile artist. Growing up in a dirt floored farmhouse in Central America, she remembers the embroidered pink dress her mother sent her from the US. Orchidia crossed the US border as a six-year-old refugee and went on to earn an associate of the arts degree from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. Orchidia co-founded Labor Fruit, a prominent artist cooperative storefront and gallery specializing in clothing as an art form. Her costumes and artwork have been showcased at the Portland Art Museum, the Shift House of the Absurd Runway Show, the City of Portland's Small Works Collection, the City of Seattle's Portable Works Collection, and more. Please welcome Orchidia Violetto to Sitka. Hi, uh, Alison, that was a warm welcome. Um, I want to thank um, uh, everyone here. Um, and 
I want to take this time to thank my brother because he's never listened to me. <laughs> and, and so I want to, I want to say hi to him. <laughs> hi, Rafa. Hola. Um, okay. I'm going to share a screen. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and all the things I'm doing in this beautiful landscape and show the artwork I've been making here. My name is Orquidia Violeta. I'm a Salvadorian American textile artist. I can collect natural objects to use in my artwork. As I say, thank you. Every time I pick something, I say a prayer for this land and we are caretakers of for a short period of time. Prayers for all the creatures and plants that I live with here. And prayers for the Watapi, the Chinese name for elk. The Watapi Wapati Wapiti is a relative who live, who brings strength, endurance, and patience. This is a story about what I've seen, heard, and learned about I mean, around the Wapiti. I took a walk along the Salmon River estuary. The wind and topography flowed together. So I went to my little studio and began sewing fiercely. I sewed the topography of this estuary into a woman's face. I added a layer over layer until she began to blow wind from her lips. Her lips and all the canvas is colored with ochre rock from the estuary. Tilka Elkins taught me to use ochre here to grind the ochre into powder and mix the powder with water. Thank you, Tilka, for teaching me to keep the well pigments alive. On my next outing, I found Cooper's hawk feathers. Later, while I was wondering what happened to the hawk, another one landed on the tree outside. Was it a sign that living and dead are out there listening? I took a trip to the Chacha Loom Museum. I was fascinated by the cedar boats and baskets. I'm humble by the basket weaving. I started a basket in my textile piece. The cedar will grow old, but not decay. I learned from Rick Williams, another resident, about salmon. We must take the dams away to save this keystone species. I put a salmon in the ocean under a tree where the land is stabilized by the streams to honor their contribution to this place. On top of Cascade Head, I look for objects. I found a painting from 1976, the year this Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve was dis designated. I put the painting inside the earring I found in Portland and sewed it onto the, her ear. She can hear what, we, what this reserve is teaching us. You can find lichen on almost every tree here. Wolf lichen, Lethardia wolpina, or Utsuna. I sewed wire onto cotton cloth and added a lichen lacing. I wanted to cover the whole tree with it, but the, that takes too much time in such a beautiful place. The forest, the grasslands, and in between ecotones, the salmon river. As I thread little blue beads, they remind me of the native people. Threading one another, threading one another. Pool, live, rise. Pool, live, rise to the river like salmon. So I titled this piece Salmon Year. The year a tree like Sika spruce gets gets to eat a salmon. 
and has a big fat growth ring around for it. Maybe you can hear the creek trickling. My next outing took me five hours because it was 12 miles long. I went up over the Cascade Head Trail into the Sisla National Forest. On the closed forest service road 1861 and came out on the rainforest trail. It was spooky out there by myself, so I found a big walking stick. They say for a mountain lion or a bear, we should act big. I know this is their home, and I'm an intruder. My collection of protective walking sticks means a lot to me, and my textile works, artworks are supported by them. With the embroidery on her face, she, she sees it all from up high to down low. She can filter out the sediments and pollutants from the rivers before they flow into the ocean. Clean water flowing off the land makes Wapiti happy. Another perfect day, hike up to Cascade Head, surrounded by beauty. I wanted to capture this moment. I took a piece of grass and I wrapped it into the embroidery. I like to embroider and weave outside. I feel the struggle and the care of the Native Americans had here on this land. And I found a rusty metal washer and hung it from her ear lobe, the lobe that crosses the water in the estuary. The name of the curves and flows around me, so I title this piece Estuary Hair. I made her hair into a depiction of the whole estuary with the curving bands of grasses, marshlands, tidal streams, forest edged, all looking out over the ocean and the world. Maybe can you hear the ocean waves? On each hike, I find more inspiring objects. Wapiti hair caught in the barbed wire fence up on the head and Wapiti teeth in the estuary. These are going into my next artwork. I have so much more to do. Thank you for all for allowing me to share my work and my experiences with you. And thank you, Allison and everyone at Sitka Center. Thank you. What a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Orchidea, for putting it together. And uh, thanks, everyone. What a wonderful uh, evening. I've just so enjoyed uh, each of you and also just some of the through lines. Uh, many of your work, I mean, all of your work has a, an approachable quality to it that makes me want to play with fabric or pick up my uh, cartooning pencil and, <laughs> and draw a horseshoe crab or uh, Diana, just the beautiful way you brought us into the writing process. Uh, just really, really welcoming presentation. So thank you, everyone. So thank you, uh, Francisca, Maddie, Diana, Zane, and Arcadia for sharing your work. Uh, welcome, Peggy. We're glad you're on the way. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight to uh, this talk. Good evening, everyone.